Hello and welcome to another episode of Back to Britpop. It's me, Chris. On this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Helm. Chris talks about his early musical influences, his time in the Seahorses with John Squire, songwriting, his subsequent musical projects after that band, and loads of other stuff in between. It's a really open and frank and honest conversation and, and it was a great pleasure to speak to him as per usual i'll be back at the end of the podcast to talk about all the ways that you can support it but until then here's chris welcome to the podcast chris helm how are you i'm good thanks chris yeah cheers mate no worries whereabouts are you i'm in a little studio that i'm renting which is weirdly built on a field in a, an industrial estate which is a uh, Back in the day, it used to be just literally fields and trees. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on the spot where we were getting chased by farmers when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Back home, so, so to speak, then. Yeah, Osbaldwick, which uh-huh. is uh, Osbaldwick, not Oswald Kirk, as it says on uh, Wikipedia, which it has said on Wikipedia for 20-odd years, actually. I was going to say, I always ask the dreaded question on, the, on these episodes, but, I mean, how's the last sort of 12, 12 months been for you? Have you been able to keep busy? Um, yeah, I have, actually. I've been doing a lot of music. I've sold my house, so I've kind of been flitting around in between places, uh, just trying to kind of settle down and, and get all my equipment out and start doing some mixing and recording and writing. Um, I've been recording with Mark Morris from the Blue Tones and Nigel Clark from Dodgy. We've been writing some stuff together for an album. We've been touring around the country anyway, doing stuff before COVID. So um, we ended up doing some gigs together and then we ended up sort of getting up at the end and playing a few songs at the end and and it just seemed to work and obviously we all know each other we've got on together for years so um been doing that uh and also also been, i've been doing handwritten lyrics weirdly which is a strange thing i never thought i'd be doing that i know that other people did do it um rick witter being one of them from shed seven um but i always felt a bit strange signing things and then you know, selling them to people. I always thought that was a bit odd. <laughs> but when all the gigs got cancelled, literally zero income. So seeing that Paul Draper from Manson had actually decided to do his, and I remember thinking to myself, okay, well, this seems to be an acceptable way of trying to get through COVID, so um, I'll give it a shot. It's quite a personal kind of, uh, it's a very personal uh, connection, isn't it, to, to fans? And especially when the lyrics can obviously mean yeah. something to somebody. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I was very surprised in the response because I know I wouldn't want them from me. So I was thinking, <laughs> why would anyone else want them? Um, and, and then it was, it was strange. I remember just scribbling out on the back of an envelope. So I didn't have any paper. And I only had one sort of half decent pen. Um, and I put the post out, took a picture of it, put a post out on Instagram and on Facebook. And within 10 minutes, I'd had over 60, uh, 60 orders. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking, I haven't got time to do this. What am I doing? <laughs> uh, but then weirdly, in some twist of fate, I ended up getting COVID uh, about two days later. And then I was in isolation for like 10 days. But one of the side effects of, of the of the uh, of the when I got it was um, that I was in bed for two months because I couldn't walk. Oh Christ! So I was got tested and I was clear, but I was still in bed. And they told me that I had osteoarthritis, which was basically I was going to be paralyzed. Well, not paralyzed, but not being able to move, for, you know, get out of bed for the rest of my life. So I was thinking, right, okay. But they're not testing me for that. They guessed that that was the case. So. What better to do than lie in bed on painkillers writing out um, lyrics to everybody? And and um, it was kind of strange, but really I couldn't actually do anything else. A lot of my friends were doing podcasts and things like that and doing online gigs. Uh, I mean, I couldn't even get out of bed, so it was pretty horrible. But um, the people, the fans were getting in touch, wanting to chat on e- emails and things, just couple, you know, initially ordering lyrics, but then having really good banter with people. So yeah. It kind of kept me sane, really. So I was very pleased uh, that I had that connection with everybody. Um, and also, it killed two birds with one stone, really, because I was, you know, keeping the wolves from the door financially. And then um, uh, a doctor rang me up three weeks after they told me that I had osteoarthritis. And she said, um, is it true that 
I can't remember his name now, doctor, someone or other rang up and did he say that, that it was pretty much your life as you know it is over? And I was like, yeah, pretty much. How do you feel about that? And I was like, well, I don't really feel anything. I've been on painkillers for the last two months. So, yeah. Um, and then she said to me, well, we don't know what it is. Uh, and he shouldn't have told you that. And I'm really glad I was reading through your notes and saw the, conversa- saw the notes from his conversation with you. So we'll get you for a blood test. And then they did. And it wasn't osteoarthritis. It was just a weird kind of arthritic, well, a rheumatoid thing that was caused from having COVID. And they'd never seen anything like it. And um, they put me on steroids and, and I got better. And, and I was very pleased to be walking around. Because oh, uh, I did actually think for three weeks that that was it. So stopped procrastinating, started to get on with things that I wanted to do. But the lyric writing thing totally sorted my head out. I mean, it was lovely just writing songs, which I haven't even sung for years, never mind, heard. So the, it, was, it was almost being back in the room when John presented me with some of the lyrics for the, his songs. And then yeah. I'm writing my, my Blinded by the Sun out. God, I've done over a thousand of these lyrics now. So it's like... You know, I can't remember. I really don't want to guess how many times I've written "Blinded by the Sun" out, but that writing that out over and over again is kind of like it just reminded me of the first day I wrote that song because it pretty much took me like maybe I don't know ten minutes to write it, and it's uh, it took me back to the little room I was writing it in in Brighton. Actually, it was really quite interesting. So I've never had that. I've sung a song thousands of times, and you don't really get that. But when you're writing the lyrics out. And yeah. also, it reminded me of writing, writing lines out at school as well. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in I yeah. must not call Miss Hildreth a twat. <laughs> yeah, really, Rick Witter went to the same school as me, so he probably feels the same. <laughs> I guess to say it's quite cathartic, I suppose, to go back and maybe think about those lyrics in potentially different ways so much time after they were initially written. It definitely showed me that my frame of mind hasn't particularly changed regarding <laughs> certain subjects. <laughs> it was over 24, I think it's 25 years actually, because I wrote that song well before I joined the Seahorses. Um, and then there's other ones like Moving On as well, which I wrote about the same time. And um, But it's a, Love is the Law is quite a good one. I love writing that one out. It just makes me chuckle because I remember the first time John presented that to me and I was like, you can't put strap on in a song, John. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get on the radio and he's going, listen, I'm putting strap on in a song and it's going to be a, our first single. So just see what happens. I do remember that with that, with that one. It's kind of like a head turner, that song, when it first came out. Because obviously I was quite excited to hear what was coming next and obviously the new project with yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember just thinking to myself, what's a dogfish egg case as well? I've only just recently looked that up. What I'm is it? it <laughs> I'm writing this out and I've still felt a bit disingenuous singing it over and over again if I don't know what I'm, meet, what I'm singing about. But um, yeah, a dogfish egg case is a, is a little egg pouch for, for dogfish, like sharks have these. Little oh, egg yeah. Egg <laughs> Although mermaid's purse does sound like a bit of a euphemism, doesn't it? <laughs> I guess strip, strip club one day and call it that. I do, I do. Yeah. I mean, in terms of um, the writing process then for you, I mean, obviously you've, you've been writing for years and your, your musical career has kind of gone from strength to strength in ways of just going back to basics in some ways and also going true to sort of or going back to folk roots ultimately. But it, it, that, that period of songwriting, has it evolved or changed? And especially some, maybe sometimes working with, with, with Mark and Nigel, having a different slant and take on things. Have you been on a journey? Is kind of what I'm trying to say. Um, well, yeah. I didn't really consider myself a, a songwriter really until I probably wrote "Blinded by the Sun" and a lot of other songs around about the same time. Um, I'd left the band I was in. Um, we were called Chuck's Bar, and we travelled around France and stuff, and we did for a few months. And we're all into different kinds of music, and none of us really knew how to play the music that we liked, so it was a bit of a mess. But we had a lot of good fun. Um, but when the game was up on that one, um, I just thought, well, I've just me and an acoustic guitar, so I'm just going to sit down and write some songs. And I was into Neil Young and Nick Drake and a, a lad called Simon Berkovich, who I used to live with in Brighton for a bit. Um, he had a massive record collection and we just he used to play me stuff like, oh, have you heard Tim Buckley? And I, uh, I was like, all right, um, have you heard of this album? Like, it's Bert Young show or whatever. And I just got into this kind of, sort of folky sort of 60s sort of I don't know slightly kind of 
well, definitely stoner music anyway. And, and I loved all that. Um, and then I, there was the Verve out at the time as well. And they were writing quite sort of acoustic sort of stuff with the rock bands. And it's just sort of evolved really from that. And I know that Wildwood at the time as well, Paul Weller's album and Stanley Road, remember when they came out and, you know, I was really into the, the, the feel of those records. Um, and obviously Oasis with Wonderwall and all of that kind of thing. And I'm just thinking, well, everyone's playing acoustic guitars on this, so I can mm. actually probably do something with this. I did some stuff with the Yards, which was after the Seahorses, and that was interesting because we we had a, a, a string section in that band, which was quite an odd thing to put in a band. And um, they were great. Uh, and all of them were at uni doing composition. So all of them could write these amazing string sections and it was just such a joy playing with them, you know, having four part harmonies and stuff and having all of these things that we could do. We could make very grand albums if we wanted for very little money. And that's what we, which we that's what we tried to do. Uh, the Seahorses was fun. Seemed to, seems to be very expensive though. Everything was like, we can only afford three strings, str- three songs with strings on, on this album. <laughs> you know, was Tony well, Tony Visconti did the arrangements and he was up. Absolutely beautiful arrangements and um, an absolute joy doing stuff with him as well. What was that like? I mean, in, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking back at that era and obviously the, the pressure must have been quite immense for you. Or did you kind of just take it in your stride? I tried to take it in my stride, but then you've got everybody's got an opinion and everyone was trying to make me be this and do that. And um, and I, did, I, I kind of wanted to please everybody, but realised that some people were at odds with each other and um you know everybody's advice always ended with just be yourself chris and i'm like you don't even fucking know me so how do you what do you how do you think that's a good idea and i felt like i was being pulled around a lot of the time um but i took it for a bit until i realized that what it was exactly what i wanted and what what i wanted to do and then i kind of got sick of trying to be someone's little puppety doll thing mm. sounds a bit odd but it was you know when i'm in the studio and people are telling me to sing more like robert plant or liam gallagher or van morrison and these are all within the same song you know i'm thinking to myself for fuck's <laughs> sake just give these people a call i'm sure they'd come and do it <laughs> you know, i cannot be asked with this yeah and yeah I, I, just, I just kind of dug my heels in really and and um yeah, and I, yeah. so I kind of figured out who I was really at that point and I realised what my priorities were with other things that were going on in my life as well, which kind of steered me into certain decisions. But um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was hard. I remember trying, well, people at the record company were trying to sort of like make me more interesting than I was. Uh, it's like they said to me, you know, so what's your story, man? What, what is it you do? I uh, remember the day when she came to the apartment I was staying in in Los Angeles and she, the girl from the, uh, the record company, can't remember her name now, but she was very sweet, but she had a job to do, which was to pr- pr- promote this other band that they just signed. Yeah. And I was like, so you must be great. You know, you're the, you're the singer and everything. How, how did you get into music? And this is all standard kind of what's your favorite color sort of bullshit. And I was like, fucking hell. Um, and I realised that I'd not really formulated a persona or anything like <laughs> maybe I should have done. Yeah. All I'd done was bust and get picked up off the street. So I was telling her this, and she's going, "You, you did what? You used to, you used to be homeless." I'm like, "No, I didn't used to be homeless at all. No, I used to busk." What's busk? And I was like, "Oh, it's busking. Busking. Which one is it? Is it busk or busking?" And I'm sat there watching her trying to write this down and crossing it out. And I'm like, "Look." It's basically when you go on the street and you play your instrument, and people throw money at you. Oh, see, so we're homeless then. No, I wasn't. <laughs> I'm like, fucking hell. And she's going, oh, I've got a great idea, Chris. We can do this whole like <laughs> Charles Dickens street urchin, urchin thing. And um, yeah, I think this is a great story. So she told everybody that, that I was, I mean, I did used to busk. I used to busk. Not as often. I wasn't up at five o'clock in the morning like everybody else was and doing it seven days a week. I used to do it when I was skint. Mm. Um, I had like three jobs and stuff. I mean, you know, I've got every respect for buskers and I actually love busking. I miss it a lot. Um, I went out maybe a couple of years ago and went busking just because I was thinking I really want to do it. Um, it's quite, I don't know, liberating to sort of 
get on the street with a guitar and play and people throw money at you, it's kind of like, well, if the shit's the fan, I've always got this sort of thing. But also, you know, it's interesting to see what people are like and the moods and the conversations that you have with people as well. And it's it's really does restore your faith in humanity a lot of the time. So she went with this thing about me being a street urchin and all this stuff and it was all kind of fucked up. So I started off on the on the wrong foot really with that. But um so all the, the press started to go on about me being a you know, a busker and it's not a problem with busking. I don't think it's a big deal at all, but they made a massive deal out of it as if it was some sort of, I was the great unwashed, you know, and I'm kind of like thinking, oh, fuck off. Was there like a relief or when when he when he did call it a day and the decision was made not to pursue a second album or a sec, uh, uh, any future sort of recording sessions and stuff? There was, because I'd not had a break. Yeah. We've been touring since, and rehearsing since we met. So, and it was full on, non-stop. John used to have a habit of going on holiday without telling us as well. So, And then when we asked the manager, well, well what are we going to do? Because he'd go away for two weeks to the Maldives or whatever. He just said, carry on rehearsing. So we'd be re-rehearsing without John there and I'd be trying to introduce new material and stuff. And it was kind of odd, really. That you just, I just didn't stop. I was a bit burnt out by the end of it. And obviously touring and all the drinking and everything else that you do and thinking you're invincible, but at that point, precarious age of 27 28 you know and i started to lose my shit a bit to be fair um i came back after touring quite a big tour we i think we'd done japan and then went on to tour with oasis and then did our own tour through december to christmas and then nothing after that that was the first time we stopped and i just didn't know what to do myself um so I went to do some writing and I holed up in this little place, a little fishing uh, lodge and um, in York and nearly drank myself to death. I just yeah. didn't know what to do with myself. It was kind of really weird. Uh, I'd never ever been in that situation before where I was just like, I was fucking exhausted with everything and I just didn't want to see anyone. But um, that's pretty much the start of the end really, I think that, because I was just really tired and I was trying to write stuff, but I didn't like anything I was writing either. So it was kind of, um, so when the band did split up, um, I was, I was pretty relieved actually. The music that we were doing, I didn't like, I didn't like one song off the second album and that includes mine. Um, Mm. so it just kind of got a little bit dark really. And even now though, when I do, you know, people, I know people send me like links to the the second album of, because it wasn't even mixed when, when the band split up, so I don't know who's taken it upon themselves to mix it uh, and master it, if it, even if that's been done. But to me, it just sounds dreadful and I don't like it. So mm-hmm. I'm glad I kind of dug my heels in a little bit because it was like, well, this isn't very good. I don't want to... We were supporting bands like the Rolling Stones and stuff like that and, and you know, singing this stuff, this new stuff, which I just didn't have any feelings for at all, really. And plus, you know, you're out there in the world of music um, and you've been successful with your first album and you wanted to compete with all the people that you love, like Radiohead and, and all these other bands that were coming out. And um, and I just thought that we weren't. I thought that we weren't at all. It was it was very difficult to, to put my pin that flag to my mast, if you know what I mean. When you took the decision to sort of to leave and to call it a day, how quickly did were you able to kind of have a vision about what you wanted to do and where you wanted to go with your, with your new solo mu- music? I didn't leave. Um, I kind of had to, if I'd left, I'd have been liable for the entire band debt to the record company. Cause we kind of got stitched up in our partnership agreement. Mm. So, um, I was, uh, reticent to leave, um, because of that. And, um, I was, the publishers were talking to me about, the songs that the new songs that we were playing and they were saying to me where 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 are your songs chris in this because um we've heard the stuff that john's been coming out with and and we don't like it it's just like i don't think this is going to work and i was like well i've got a lot more songs but it just john said that his songs were better (laughs) so (laughs) it didn't look in a lot of them so the publisher said to me well why don't you consider um, doing like a 
sort of a sideline solo stuff like that and you can do all your sort of stuff that you want to do during you know in doing that and this was when we were kind of doing demos for the the uh the second album and our co-manager was there and he basically threatened to sue me um if i went and did a solo thing and he said this in front of the publisher as well and i remember this just thinking wow this is the world that I'm in. I, mm. And I felt, I'd never felt so sort of hemmed in when this was supposed to be the dream job. And yet I've still got people making my life really difficult. So that's when I decided, right, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of this. I'm not making these motherfuckers any more money. They can, they can shove it up the backside. And that's, um, that's basically what happened in my head. <laughs> and that happened. So, um, yeah. And then the, I think, John got a bit sick of my behaviour, so he was the one who pulled the plug eventually. Um, and I wish he'd done it sooner, really. Doing your own music live, uh, you know, solo or with collaborating with other musicians, um, that must have been something that was just a breath of fresh air for you then? Yeah, it was. It was interesting because, uh, you know, I just wanted to kind of do stuff that I felt, really, that had some sort of... Im- emotional value um and and i did i did come out with some nice stuff i think and, and i had a lot of help from some friends um who've gone on to do good stuff as well and uh, i remember doing some some writing with dave keegan and um ended up playing with stuart fletcher still I still play with stuart he's an amazing bass player and a lovely guy um did some recording with mal scott uh I met a guy called James Nisbet, who was a guitarist, who was great. Um, but then I've gone on to, you know, because I was a solo artist, he can kind of work with whoever you want, really, I suppose, and circumstances dictated. Personnel changes here and there. So I um, ended up with The Yards, which was essentially me, Stuart, Paul Banks, and a guy who'd been doing some drumming for me called John Miller. And then we got uh, the, the string section in, and then uh, we got um, John Hargreaves, who was on keyboards as well. Um, and that just grew into this sort of thing, really. It was quite a lot of us in the band. Um, so uh, there was a bit of a culling that was instigated by Paul Banks. <laughs> and then I wasn't happy about that. Paul's, I'm a bit of a socialist and Paul isn't. So, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that didn't end well. I've apologised to him since, and he's apologised to me. But I totally understood his thinking, really, when I think about it now. But, um, yeah, that kind of... Uh, it was just an interesting sort of development. And it meant that the, the, we had to replace Paul Banks with uh, Chris Farrell. And um, Chris is... I've known Chris for years, and he's such a great... Well, a great guitarist. He, he can play really anything, and he's... Um, um, we still play together. We still write a lot together. Uh, it's all inspiring stuff. So I think, you know, a lot of the yards as well played on, on my solo album, The Rookery. Um, it's just nice to be able to sort of, it's nice to just play with whoever you want to play with, really. And it's amazing that I'm playing with Nigel and, Ma- and Mark as well. It's, uh, I mean, the Blue Tones and Dodgy were, you know, they were up there for me. It was like they were kind of, I think I pr- preferred the blue tones to the stone roses and dodgy as well. So mm. My kind of thing. In terms of writing with those guys then and, and, and having that initial conversation about, hang on, let's do something together proper. How did that come about? Um, well, we sort of always tried to squeeze it in around what we were doing. And then lockdown came and COVID and we were just like, well, we need, we should get together. And so we had a few zoom calls and everything. And then, when lockdowns were, and the restrictions were lifted, we went to a couple of Airbnbs to do some writing together. And, and we ended up presenting songs that we had, which we thought would work for the three of us. So that's happened a lot. Um, and um, just coming up with ideas, really. And yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, we're all really busy doing stuff. I'm finishing my album at the moment, uh, my the next solo album. And, and Nigel's got a lot going on with his stuff and Dodgy and Mark's got a lot of stuff going on with him and the Blue Tones and his solo stuff as well. So it's just a matter of fitting it all in. But we're, we're touring with Shed 7 um, in November and December. So that's going to be a nice little kind of 
I don't know, really, showcase for our our new stuff. But we're also going to be singing stuff, obviously, that people have heard. Otherwise, we'll we'll get lynched. I don't think the Shed Seven fans would appreciate it. If we just <laughs> sat and played, you know, eight brand new songs that they'd never heard. It wouldn't be the warmest warm up band, would it? So are you going to do like it in the rounds kind of uh, situation, or are you going to just sort of contribute to each other each other's tracks? Well, say if I was, you know, playing. I don't know, slight return or something like that. You know, we're, you might Mark could be there, and we, yeah, I guess everybody just steps stands into the centre, maybe I don't know, and we'll just play them. Yeah, um, that's how I kind of envision it really. But it's just an honour to be playing on these songs. Um, yeah, and it's uh, the harmonies really work as well. We kind of accidentally started singing some Crosby, Stills and Nash uh, songs in the dressing room, and we realised that even though we'd never sang them before. We, we all knew the words because we'd listened to it so often when we were touring around and stuff that um, yeah. independently from each other. So it just all fitted and we all knew where our parts were. And um, it just seemed to be quite magical, really, and, and a bit too easy, uh, if I'm honest. <laughs> it was like, oh, this is, is this good? This is good, isn't it? No, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, not to press you on it, I mean, you might, you might not be able to tell me, but. When do you think we might be able to hear some of that material then in terms of like recordings and releasing it? Um, the Shad stuff. Uh, I mean, we need to, we're quite busy as far as up to probably the end of the year now. So I don't think we'll have time to actually go in and record an album and have it ready for the tour. Mm. We definitely will be doing it in the new year. Yeah. So there's talk of a tour of our own in April. So that, that I'm looking forward to that. Um, and we'll have the album out by then. So um, I guess in between now and April <laughs> next year. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Probably yeah, well, j- January. And um, yeah, I'd say between January and April. And, and your new album, how's that coming along? Have you finished most it's of the writing? Along, I'm just really picky because <laughs> I made the mistake of learning how to record things and, and mix things and produce things. So I, I kind of, I know there's a million different kind of, permutations of of what it could be uh but i've basically delegated it now to my mate dave boothroyd who's a fantastic engineer and um yeah we're going through it and it's he's getting it to sound a lot like i want it and more so um that's happening at a rate of knots actually i think that's hopefully going to be finished by the middle of september um which isn't very long away at all so uh, I'm just wondering what, when to release it, whether I should maybe do the stuff with Mark and Nigel before I release it uh, and then release that kind of after we've finished doing the cycle of our album. Mm. I don't and- know. I mean, the thing is, my music's not particularly trendy or anything, so it's not like it's going to go out of fashion. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, classic songwriting sort of style with, um, you know, Hey, I mean it, man, or whatever it is. <laughs> I'm supposed to say. Um, Chris, who were your, um, who are your sort of songwriting heroes? Well, I don't sound like any of them before I start on that. <laughs> one. But uh, I love um, Neil Young. Uh, obviously, there's the Beatles and the Stones. Nick Drake, Bert Jansch, um John Martin. Uh, Beck, I'm a big fan of Beck. Um, we supported Beck actually in our early sort of Seahorses days, and that was that was definitely a, a an eye opener. And I, I loved his music since then. Father John Misty stuff, I really like his. I like a lot of stuff actually. I wouldn't say that I kind of like you know hang on his every word, but I do appreciate where he's coming from and what he's doing. I think you know, it's very mm. clever. Um, Scott Matthews did a, some tours with Scott Matthews. He's great, and he's comes. Well, he's consistently writing great music and coming out with brilliant albums. Yeah, I love Scott um, Matthews. Yeah, he's such a great guitarist as well. I mean, I, I toured with him and I realised that I was quite basic compared <laughs> to his skill. And and I really, he made me, he didn't force me to, but in my own mind, I just thought to myself, do you know what? I'm going to try and do this a little bit better. So I tried to brush up a little bit on my guitar skills. So I've never considered myself a guitarist anyway, but... Um, I think I'm kind of getting by a bit better now, thanks to Scott Matthews. So, and he was always very encouraging and had a lot of uh, little great little tips and stuff like that to, to offer. Mm. 
Um, yeah, but it's kind of oh Van Morrison without a doubt as well. It's just so many, uh, but it's all quite sort of sixties, seventies stuff. Christmas music always in your family. Uh, my grandma used to sing and play the organ um, before she went to church and after she went to church. And she had quite a warbling voice, I remember. My dad used to go, oh, bloody hell, she's <laughs> warbling again. But she had this kind of electric, I think it was a pipe organ, because it used to whir really loudly. I remember it was like having a hoover on. And um, she'd be. it was quite cool when I think about it. I wish I still had it. It was this weird 60s thing. And uh, she had the kind of Beatles songbook and everything. And she'd be going, yesterday, all my troubles in. And it was like, oh, my God, <laughs> like my teeth listening to this. Um, and it was all a bit much. But she was great. But she wasn't. She didn't teach me how to, how to play music or anything. I wasn't allowed anywhere near that organ. Um, my granddad was into records and things. And I remember him buying himself a Bon Tempe keyboard and struggling to play some Boney M, which was quite strange. <laughs> uh, and then my mum and dad, my mum used to sort of sing a bit. Uh, it used to irritate me that she'd always sing it wrong. So my sister was a big music fan. She was, but she didn't play, but she was into, in fact, she was really quite instrumental in the music that I like and what, you know, the early days, because she was a mod, so she was into the Who. It was all around about sort of 1978, 79, when there was a mod revival going on. So there's bands like The Jam and Secret Affair, Nine Below Zero and all these new bands that were coming out that were all professing to be mods. Um, I think Quadrophenia had come out and, uh, you know, so, and the Quadrophenia album that I had, I'd, I'd loads of stuff on, like Tamla Motown stuff and, um, you know, a lot of 60s stuff. And that's why I, I just started loving all that stuff. And then my sister got into the Kinks and the Beatles and um, she never got into the Stones, weirdly. Um, but yeah, it was quite, and then she got into Prince and I got into hip hop. I refused to get into Prince. I couldn't understand what, what she liked about him. And then I just couldn't get his songs out of my head. And then I just became obsessed with Prince for a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, electronic sort of street sounds kind of breakdance music as well. I used to love all that electro stuff. Um, so quite a wide sort of thing, really. But, but I used to sing along to Ter 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 Terence Trent Derby records and also sing along to Prince records as well. Um, and I guess that's when I started singing when my sister was out of the house and I'd just play her Prince records and sing into the gatefold and think that nobody could hear me. <laughs> you know, a bit like when dogs were hard and they just put their head behind a settee and all the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do, you, um, do you remember like when you kind of had that realisation that you might want to be a songwriter? I didn't really think I had anything to say. Um, I always thought, it always seemed like that's what other people did. And that's what we were made to believe at school as well. Uh, they, were, they weren't very encouraging in the 70s at primary school and they definitely weren't at secondary school in the 80s. And um, I didn't do music at school. Um, and I loved creative writing. I was, you know, I'm doing English literature and stuff like that. And, uh, I, I really enjoyed making stuff up and, you know, this creating this whole world. And that's something I don't do now because obviously there's a lot of other people that are a lot better at it. But with songs, I think I started off writing quite basic sort of stuff that wasn't particularly deep or it was honest stuff. It was more like keeping a diary, really. So, mm. And then just playing a few cards around it. But I remember started writing, I started to learn a song first when I started to play guitar and, I, and sing. And I, I remember not being able to do it, so I got all the chords wrong, and then I was getting the words wrong, and I just thought, and the melody wrong. I thought, well, I might as well just write my own song then. So, so I did. <laughs> and it was called "Falling in and Out of Love with You." Ah, oh. um, yeah. <laughs> well, I remember how it goes. Are they? Aren't they? Aren't everyone's first songs? as deep as that. I mean, I think my, my first songs were, were equally as kind of centered around love and not being able to, you know, talk about it or anything like that. And, you know, I was writing songs at, at sort of 12, 13, all the same. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. I, mean, sort of, I used to write songs about people and their kind of personalities and why they were unreasonable. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, it's almost like, well, it's not my fault kind of songs. It's your fault, it's not my fault. And I wrote a lot of those. I think I had quite a lot of uh, buried angst and, and uh, yeah, probably a few issues that needed addressing back then. When I look back at the lyrics, it's like, oh, Chris, get over yourself. Just get some fucking counsel in. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it's, you know, I was young and the hormones were all over the shop and everything. So Yeah. So anything like that on the new album? Yes. It's <laughs> riddled with it. Oh, God. There is actually, there's quite a lot of dark stuff and, and, and I've tried, I tried to make things light, but it's been a sort of a tumultuous, if that's the right word, um, uh, 18 months really. So there's a lot of honest stuff on there that, mm. um, that maybe I might not put on there because it is actually, you've got to be careful because if people start asking you to play these things at every gig for the rest of your life, then you really want to break down and cry after you've sang it, then it's not going to be good for my mental health. And it's very good for the, uh, know, the psychology industry, I suppose, but not for my brain. So I think um, I did do, when I, when I started back doing gigs after lockdown, and I threw some songs in there that I'd, I'd written during lockdown. And, and I remember it was one gig I was supposed to play for about an hour. And I think I managed 26 minutes before I actually thought I was going to start crying. Um, and I thought to myself, fucking hell. It was a couple of, it's basically a mixture of not gigging for a while, being a bit overwhelmed that people were there clapping and being lovely and also just stuff that had happened. So, and what I was singing about and, and uh, yeah, it was quite, I, I took myself by surprise there really, because I've never had a, a moment like that before. Mm. So, I'm going to have to be a bit careful about what I reveal in songs. But isn't isn't that like um, indicative of kind of getting older as well? Because the, the the tears flow so much more easily. I mean, I'm 43 and I just cry everything these days. Yeah, because have you got kids? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's, That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't have kids, you wouldn't be so bad. Uh, yeah. Because the world doesn't revolve around you anymore. And you you do anything for your kids, and this is it. It's uh, I think I've become a bit more. What's the word? Become a lot angry with the world, but also a bit more cautious about what I write about and things because it has impact on people. Mm. Um, and it could be positive or it could be negative, you know. And it's got and also you know when you're older, you learn that. Well, I'm speaking from my own experience, but I, I learned how to become how to process. How I feel just by talking about it rather than having to write it down and put it into a song and then weirdly a month later I'll realize what that song's about. That used to happen quite a lot actually. It'd be these kind of what I'd thought were subconscious outpourings. But I knew there was like a thread keeping it all together. Mm. And then about a month later you'd be like, oh my god, that's what that's about. Oh shit. It's it's interesting really how your mind works really and stuff like that. Well, Chris, I'll I'll let you go. Um, I, I must say, I'm really, really chuffed that you've uh, found the time to speak to me, and it's been such a fantastic interview. Absolutely, and thanks for asking me. And um, yeah, it's it's cheaper than therapy, all this stuff. So yeah. I'll bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Chris. I'll let you go, mate. Take care. Take care, mate. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks again to Chris for joining me on the podcast. I really appreciate him opening up and talking about his time in, in the Seahorses and everything else that's happened in the last 25 years or so. So a massive thanks to everybody uh, that listens every week. I really do appreciate your support. As you know, it's a completely independent podcast. I'm not part of any network and I don't have any sponsor. So any of these three things will really help. Firstly, if you'd like to review the podcast, just pop to Apple and on the Apple, the desktop, just give me a five star rating. And if you have time, just do a little review. That really helps as well. Also, you can follow me on the social media channels. Just search for Back to Britpop on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. And lastly, if you want to say thank you financially, you can buy me a virtual coffee. And the link to that is in the show notes. That will help just pay for the distribution of the podcast and any other costs to run it. So thanks again. Really appreciate all your support. Hopefully I have another episode for you next weekend. Take care. Mm -hmm.